Hello everyone, very happy to see you here again today. Today, we're going to be discussing what value stream mapping is, how it can help you optimize your processes. If you want to understand how to implement DevOps in a better way, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this conversation with Steve. Steve Pereira is known as the value stream guy. So who else is better than him to be here with us? So if you like this content, hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe and activate the notification bell so you don't miss anything in the future. Thank you. For those who don't know you yet, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, I've been in tech for about 20 years. I've always been obsessed with process and how things work and how things fit together. And that has sort of evolved over the course of my career to now being focused on how do things fit together and how do we actually create and deliver value? So that's where all of my efforts currently lie. And that's brought me to value streams and value stream mapping. So I'm previously a startup CTO. I was in tech support. I was in IT management. I was in build and release engineering, all these different areas always focused on delivering value, of course, but not dedicated to really understanding and demonstrating to others in a collaborative way how that happens. And that's where I see a massive opportunity now, and that's where I spend all of my energy. That's amazing. And of course, I'm assuming when you're talking about value stream, we are not talking about only on our work, but when I, when I see software development. This can be applied to any industry. Exactly. That's where I see the magic of it. You know, the, the real opportunity here is that we're now looking beyond software uh, to the reality that technology is affecting every single aspect of a business, but the same methodologies and practices that we use both within IT and tech, but mm -hmm. also in other areas of business, apply throughout the entire organization, right? All of these concepts eventually coalesce to the same principles, the same focuses, the same efforts, mm -hmm. because we are all hopefully working together in the same direction to deliver value. And so that actually removes a bunch of barriers and a bunch of separation between what marketing cares about and what marketing is doing and what success is worried about and doing, all of a sudden, once we see the reality that this is all just collections of value streams, interconnected value streams, flowing value to customers, we're all now pulling in the same direction, right? We're all now working together in concert, collaboratively to do this work and to deliver this value. And that's just such a powerful and positive message uh, and very, very different from, you know, uh, a few years ago where all these departments and all of these roles were at odds with each other mm -hmm. with separate incentives. You know, they have separate incentives, but that doesn't mean we should have separate outcomes, separate focuses and be pulling against each other rather than pulling with each other. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss about what your thoughts on the future of the value stream, but I want to connect to one piece of my past, and it's a very interesting one. And why I'm saying that, being a consultant, it's pretty normal for you to, okay, let's engage with the client and discuss how we can improve their customer experience. So I'm not talking about my client experience, but their client experience, right? And Every single time discussing about software development and etc. This is where my my experience relies to. But most of the time, uh, to us to be able to discuss how we can enhance their clients' experience, the first conversation is because to some problem that has happened. Okay, their client is face is facing some issues. So I. I'm saying that most of my time in the past, when I was discussing about value streams, is uh, in a reactive mode. We do have a problem and we need to fix right now. But right. Some, at some point, 
we understand how important is the customer experience, right? To design the system, think on their client, on the, about the end user. And sometimes to start engaging this conversation with this client, with the clients, it's not that easy. They, it's not that they don't understand, but their focus is on another path. Okay, we need to deliver something fast, we need to do something fast, let's deal with that later. But I'm talking about big corporations. I'm not talking about startups where we can, we can facilitate this type of conversations easier. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Steve? And have you seen, now that we are in this pandemic, right, where we have to decrease costs, we need to enhance to increase revenue, so all optimizations are valid right now. Do you think that my experience is something that you have been facing in the past? And do you think that this pandemic situations will change the way the senior leadership are seeing the value stream? That's a great question. I have a sense that there's there's a few questions in there, but let me see if I can pick it apart and we can we can talk about specific aspects if they're if they're more interesting than others. Uh, I would say that that definitely echoes my experience as a consultant and an individual contributor, as a leader in organizations. Uh, the, you know, the fire that, that arises is always going to capture our attention, right? It's always going to be uh, urgent and top of mind. So we, we naturally get drawn into reacting to situations. And I don't think that that's going anywhere anytime soon. I also don't think that, you know, our ability to predict um, any number of possible uh, outcomes or incidents is going to near 100% anytime soon as well. So I think that reacting is always going to be uh, a, a very clear and present possibility in, in our work. That being said, what we focused on in DevOps in the past couple of years and increasingly across different industries is our ability to respond, right? And accelerating our ability to respond. So how can we quickly assess a situation and leverage our prior experience, but also a set of practices that are ready to go and and um, preparing us to execute on known valuable efforts so let's say you know we have a data breach you know it's inevitable in 2020 that data breaches are going to happen which means you know we don't know when they're going to happen, but when they happen, we need to respond effectively, um, very rapidly and with a sense of order, right? It's so that we're not burning out our staff and everyone is running around panicking. You know, we should be planning for that eventuality with a playbook, with a set of practices that, that we have rehearsed. Um, and the context here in a value stream is that a lot of people will look at a value stream when they hit a breaking point, right? When they hit a bottleneck or a situation, an unprecedented situation such as uh, COVID-19, where all of a sudden you have to revisit, okay, we have to start doing more with less, or you know, we have to boost value because we're now um, forced to do uh, activities that were a portion of our business and now need to be more significant because we have diminished possibilities in other areas, right? So we need to boost the value of specific activities and maybe retire or put some other activities on hold. Mm -hmm. um, we need the ability to innovate and automate because we see new capabilities that are being driven by this, um, this reality mm -hmm. and investment by other organizations and facilitating partners and such, um, other things like that, like the fact that, you know, Zoom is now far more capable now than it was before COVID-19, what can you do to leverage that? How can that fit into your, your practices, into your value stream to drive better outcomes or faster value delivery? Um, we have these opportunities for team building as well. So how can we come together to create 
a view of the value stream, a visualization of a value stream, such that we're bringing everybody into the same perspective, right? Everybody has their own assumptions about how everything works and where the biggest problem is. So a value stream mapping exercise can bring a team together and reset their common understanding of, okay, what are we dealing with here? What's going on? Where's our biggest challenges? Where should we all be focusing? How do I contribute to the overall value stream? These are questions that we can answer with a mapping exercise. So it's become extremely valuable to have these practices where we can step away from our daily work, which in some cases it's been, you know, pulled out from under us and it's not even the same anymore. But we can remove ourselves from our day-to-day -day or our prior day-to-day -day reality, look at the current reality, pick a direction based on data and actual measurement. And along the way, we're coming together as a team to combine our experiences, to combine our different perspectives into a common picture that gives us a high degree of confidence that we know what to do next. Mm -hmm. And that has become absolutely essential. I love when you mentioned that let's work as a team. We, 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 you said we a lot of times there. So you, of course you put yourself into their shoes, being part of their team, right? When you are providing this, you, you, your job to a client, right? So it's essential. Absolutely. I, you know, part of, uh, one of the most valuable aspects of facilitation is the, the reality that you're coming in from outside, right? So coming in from outside means I'm not carrying the biases of, of the team that I'm working with. I'm not uh, uh, subject to their politics or uh, any of the issues that may be weighing them down or, or putting blinders on their perspectives and, and having them focus in a specific way. I can come in and ask questions that they wouldn't normally ask, or I can dig where they wouldn't necessarily think to dig. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm there as a facilitator to assist, right? It's a supporting activity. Um, and it's quite different, I think, than typical consulting, right? I mean, I, I call myself a consultant, but most of the time what I'm doing is pulling the answers out of the team, right? I'm, I'm helping them to realize the answers to their problems and develop the solutions along with them. And I think that's absolutely critical. And it is a, a big departure from traditional consulting because you're helping them build the ability to solve their own problems, right? I mean, I, throughout my whole career, I've always tried to put myself out of a job and I can't seem to shake that uh, pattern. I'm just always gonna do it. I'm always wanting to give other people the capabilities that I have and let them use them and let them leverage them. Um, so for me, the facilitation aspect is super important because I want to be leveling up companies and then moving on to another opportunity, right? There's so many companies, so many teams with these problems. And if you can only solve them when you're working directly with them, you're not leaving them in a better situation when you, when you go onto something else, right? And we all know the Boy Scout principle of leave something better than when you arrived. Um, and I think that's very true for consulting and, and facilitating. You want to be uh, instilling capabilities into the teams that we work with so that they can carry on the efforts and scale them and develop new abilities that you never even imagined, mm -hmm. right? but you've got to really allow them to develop those skills themselves. One thing that I've, I've, I've noticed, of course, and always on this reactive side, which I hate, to be quite honest, right? My desire would be, let's be proactive and let's start this discussion about how we can we can add more value and enhance your value stream upfront, right? This would be my, my ultimate desire, but haven't happened to me, unfortunately. But one thing that I, I also saw, Steve, is that most of the senior leadership, they like to use some, uh, some words to show that they are following some trends. So let me give you an example. Uh, automation, for example, right? Everyone thinks that automation is the best thing to do. And I would say not necessarily, depends on your, on the pain that you are trying to solve. 
And I was working with this pharmaceutical company, and for for some reason, of course, there is a, a, a directive right there. The board wants to use these words, and it's RPA. So the finance team on that company. So I need to implement RPA throughout my my business unit. So let's identify all the manual process that we have, and I want to implement RPA. And my first question was, but why RPA? And the answer was, because I want this to be automatized. I need to automate everything. But I said, but not necessarily. You are, you're gonna automate using RPA. There's way more other ways to do that. And better ways depends on your. So let's evaluate the ROI. Let's evaluate your business, your, the pain you are trying to solve. And then we can decide if automation is a path that we need to follow. And as I said, unfortunately, sometimes they don't give the chance for us to discuss client experience, right? The, to do a, a proper value stream because they just want to push some to some direction and etc. Uh, how do you feel about that, Steve? It's it's a pattern I've seen all over the place, and I think it's very common for executives to feel like they may be missing something or that there is a delta between their organization and leaders in the industry or the competition or this pressure to just increase the distance between them and the competition, right? There's a lot of competing um, pressure that will force an executive or a leader to fixate on a perceived value or perceived opportunity or risk and then quickly try to align their teams and their efforts towards achieving an outcome mm -hmm. to address it, right? I think that's perfectly, um, it's perfectly rational, it's perfectly normal. The, the challenge is, of course, when the reality is, there is one constraint at any given time that is worthy of your attention, mm -hmm. right? And everything else is less important and i think we forget that you know we, we always forget that out of everything that we could possibly do tackling our most uh challenging constraint our most impactful constraint is the best option at mm -hmm. any given time and it allows us to prioritize it allows us to focus our efforts it allows us to understand when things are working and not working which i think is a big problem that that goes unaddressed, especially when you're talking about automation and, and RPA specifically. Mm -hmm. If we go and uh, take a team with a lot of manual tasks, handoffs, toil, and we say, automate everything. How do we know what worked? Mm -hmm. If anything worked, right? How are we going to know if we're on the right track, if our efforts are paying off, if we could do better, mm -hmm. we're gonna miss so much data and signaling and indicators of progress at, unless we target specific bottlenecks and opportunities that we have targeted because of actual data. Mm -hmm. That's where I see the value behind value stream mapping is that we're going to collect that data. You're going to see those hotspots. You're going to be able to rank them and say, this is our biggest constraint. This is second, this is third. You could split your efforts you could scientifically approach that and say, our hypothesis to address this is X, our hypothesis to address this is Y, and we have Z. You could have three teams go tackle those things, but you can measure those impacts directly. And that is a huge difference from automate everything. All of a sudden now, you know exactly what's working, what's not working. You can prove the effects of all of your efforts you know when it's time to move on to something else, which I think is another big problem, because we have diminishing returns in all of these efforts, right? I mean, automating the last mile might take you years with almost no discernible payoff, right? You might not even notice a difference. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a very costly risk that we need to avoid. So absolutely blind automation or universal application of automation or technology to solve problems 
is uh, a recipe for, for tons of waste and really, I think, burning out your teams um, who aren't going to understand the value because they're on the ground. They're the ones who know what's painful, where the friction is, where the automation might be best applied. Just showering it down from on high from leadership, mm -hmm. you're going to really, you're going to damage trust. You're going to like absolutely fail in your efforts. I mean, there's no recipe for success there, right? I mean, you're just automating things based on manual or not. It's not going to drive a good story and it's not going to fuel a practice of continuous improvement. And, and especially when you are talking about, for example, DevOps, right? This concept everyone now wants to adopt. And I saw some discussions that people think that DevOps is just to automate things. You want to put in place my CI, CD pipeline, I'm implementing DevOps. Totally not true. If you don't do a, a proper right, value stream mapping from end to end, especially because there's a lot of culture, right? A mindset to be changed to correctly implement a, a DevOps, nothing's going to be implemented correctly, right? There is a misleading situation there. So how do you think, Steve, that the value stream mapping can, can help an a organization to implement correctly a DevOps? It's a great question. I think there's a big risk inside of DevOps as a term, DevOps as a focus, and the community itself to be very narrow in their focus and their execution, mm -hmm. which means that you're missing risks and opportunities upstream and downstream of your focus area, right? You're looking too narrow at the problem. There could be a much easier much more valuable constraint to tackle upstream, downstream, uh, or you know, just, just something that you haven't seen yet, which is very possible. If you're just going by, okay, I need to automate everything. I need a CI CD pipeline. I need infrastructure automation. I need uh, the, the ability to spin up and tear down test environments. That checklist approach it doesn't imply any kind of priority. It, it has no connection to constraint. It has no connection to performance, to actual outcomes, to value delivery. And so it's disconnected from reality. It's disconnected from the needs of your customers, the needs of your business, the needs of your teams to, to collaborate and to feel as if they are working together on the same team. So there's so many problems with that approach. And so, refocusing and adopting this perspective of value stream thinking mm -hmm. of what we really care about here is the big picture, right? Ultimately, we're, we care about delivering value. Anyone who tells you differently is simply not thinking clearly about the reason we have business. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can step back and think of things in terms of value streams and, and see the value stream, then all of a sudden we can very practically apply specific techniques and technologies and automation in our efforts, but we'll be able to justify them and feel very confident in those decisions, whether we're talking to business, whether we're talking to the board, whether we're talking to our customers, success, sales, marketing, everybody else, we can say, yeah, this is exactly why we did this, is to target this opportunity that we identified because we looked at the big picture, which incorporates you're here, you know, marketing is here, sales is here, we're all here in the value stream, and here's why we're making this decision. That is a much more unifying approach that goes so far beyond DevOps and where everybody is thinking that you know, it's really pulling me in the direction of like, I don't talk about DevOps anymore. Aside from, I run the biggest meetup, the, the biggest DevOps meetup in Canada, and we talk about DevOps. But beyond that, I really don't talk about DevOps on a regular basis because it's so narrow, right? It's really focused on very specific activities. 
and the culture around those activities, which is incredibly important. But I see a much larger opportunity when it comes to value streams, right? All of a sudden now we're able to address risks and opportunities at the organizational level, at the customer level. And that to me just amplifies all the efforts, all the outcomes that we can drive. And especially, because I don't want to say, of course, DevOps is a whole concept because it's not. But when you're talking about DevOps, we need to include now the security team, right? To talk about DevSecOps. So it's more, uh, even more aligned with what you said, because if you are talking about development operations, you need to get together with marketing, with sales to discuss the whole value stream. So the security team will be there also. So it makes more sense to talk on a holistic way with all the groups. Anyone who knows me will know that I am no fan of the term DevSecOps or Dev anything ops. I'm not even a fan of the term DevOps. I think you know these narrow terms where we try and shoehorn different broad terms into something super concise and easy to pronounce or talk about doesn't mean that they're easy to understand, mm -hmm. right? The more we kind of simplify these things in terms of a lexicon that doesn't necessarily fit, then people get confused, right? Which is why we have this massive spectrum of what people think of when they think of DevOps, right? If you ask eight people, you get eight different answers. Um, so I think that absolutely security is a key component within the value stream. I think it it fits as a first class citizen, just like everything else. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to worry about shoehorning it in. We don't have to worry about saying value sex stream. It doesn't make sense, just like it doesn't make sense in DevOps. So if we can focus more on value streams, nobody's left out. Nobody feels like they have to be called out specifically. There's no need for a focus on any specific area mm -hmm. unless it's an area of concern, right? Which I think is so powerful and so valuable. All of a sudden, not only is security involved, design is involved, support is involved, finance is involved. Everyone and we don't have to overload these terms in order to get there. And that to me, it just saves so much time and effort and uh, we're in a much better place talking about value streams than we are talking about DevOps and, and DevSecOps or Fin DevOps or GitOps or whatever else you want. The way I see is that it, it's, so, it's great to have been discussed about DevOps, to discuss about DevSecOps, because at least show evolution of things, right? Probably in 2010 and prior to that, to discuss about the whole concept, if you implement, for example, a value stream mapping, you know, the organization would be like overwhelming for them. So let's start a little bit smaller and then we can evolve and now we can talk in a holistic way and, and not talk specifically about DevOps, but in a broader term. Actually, that's the way, that's the way I see it's not that necessarily bad. I think it's a necessary evolution in the terms that we use, right? I think that we're, what we're doing is realizing that not that DevOps needs to encompass all of these things, right? I think the wrong answer is to shoehorn all these things into the umbrella of DevOps, especially because DevOps has momentum. People are talking about DevOps, so let's pile a bunch of stuff in there so that, you know, it's almost like jumping on the car that's, that's headed in your direction. Mm -hmm. You get a free ride, right? So, but eventually the, crowd, the car gets too crowded and it's gonna break down at some point, right? Or veer off the road. So what we really benefit from is saying, okay, yes, now that we're talking about cross silo collaboration, which is what we're really, really talking about if we're talking about inclusion, if we're talking about rallying different perspectives and aligning different incentives, then yes, let's talk about, let's use DevOps as an example of how we've tackled that problem and now go tackle that problem in security or yeah. in finance or elsewhere. We can leverage the learning and the momentum that we've got from DevOps in any number of ways. And I think that's super valuable. Makes super sense, Steve, 100% agree. But talking about the future, Steve, what is your prediction 
when we're talking about value value stream mapping for next year? Well, the main difference between last year and this year is certainly that all of my mapping practices, everything that I've been doing in conference rooms with teams directly is now virtual and, and online, which is fantastic. It's been wonderful. I honestly think it's, it's removed a lot of friction. It's made it a lot easier for people to do mapping exercises. Uh, I get faster outcomes. I get higher quality outcomes. Um, it's a way of remote teams truly working together and collaborating in ways that they have never done before. So it's been fantastic to be perfectly honest and I never would have expected it. I was hoping that we would get there, but mm -hmm. I was thinking that that horizon was five years in the future and it just got rapidly accelerated. Getting people, especially when your participants are off video or, mm -hmm. you know, they stay muted the entire time because they've got a crazy family situation going on. Um, that's absolutely challenging. And so it's, it's, it's stretched my um, abilities and, and grown muscles of facilitation more than it has with technique, right? I mean, I've, I've really improved in terms of facilitation and my ability to help people collaborate and help people kind of pull value out of their shared knowledge. And that's been incredible. And that probably would have taken years without the current situation. Where I see the future of all that is hopefully people are starting to realize that these practices need to become part of their DNA. They really need to become core capabilities because, you know, adaptation is always necessary. Mm -hmm. We always need to be looking for operational efficiencies and removing waste and improving value and boosting quality. All of these benefits that we get from value stream mapping, they need to be just part of our operating model, right? I mean, the fact that we only do these things when things are grinding to a halt or we have no idea what's going on, literally things are on fire and you're thinking about removing flammable objects in your house, right? I mean, it's a little bit too late. Um, and that's when you have to come in and you have to hose everything down and your whole, your whole life gets ruined. Basically you start from scratch. We don't want to get there. Right. And I don't work with teams that are, you know, at a, at a breaking point. Most often they're always looking for better. They're always in good shape looking to improve their performance. The people who are really on fire, they, they don't think of doing something like value stream mapping because they're not thinking in terms of holistic mm -hmm. visualization and data collection. They're not there. They're in a situation where they're constantly fighting fires all the time. So they don't even think of the idea of stepping away and assessing what's going on uh, because they're in a panic. They're just in a constant state of reaction, right? So I think there is a lot of opportunity to go from this early adopters of things like value stream mapping who are looking ahead and trying to really grapple with complexity and friction and all the opportunities and risks that they have mm -hmm. to spreading that through every organization, right? The future is here, it's, it's just not evenly distributed. And the future is here in terms of value stream mapping and the value that it provides, it's just not everybody is doing it. Mm -hmm. And the teams that are doing it, they do it when they hit friction, when they hit, when they hit a major problem or situation, instead of adopting the capability, you know, mm -hmm. people don't reach out to me to say, "Hey, we want to learn how to do this so that we can do it all the time." Can we just run a value stream mapping session with this process just to see if there's any chance for improvement? This type of situations never have, right? It's just we have a problem, help me to solve it, which is great. Right, but as you said, to having the core of the company is essential, right? Right. I mean, it's we have to we have to adopt these capabilities as second nature. They have to be, become part of our organizations. Otherwise, you know, what other mechanisms do you have for continuous improvement? We'll try better next time, or we have retrospectives where we highlight some uh, action items. Well, what are those based on? They're based on 
individual opinions that we collect in a team, they're not in reference to a flow of value, right? Mm -hmm. They're in reference to a sprint or some activities that you're performing. That could be completely in the wrong direction, right? I mean, you could be building the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You could easily be way off base, way off target. And stepping away and looking at your value stream and why do we do any of this stuff? What is the value of all this stuff that we're doing? That pays off a hundred to one based, you know, compared to a retrospective or any of the other activities that we're doing to assess our current state and our, and our, and our performance. And as I said at the very beginning, right, this would be my ultimate desire to see that, okay, uh, we know now that we need to improve process. We need to decrease our costs. We need to be more cost effective. Where we can be cost effective? Let's take a look on IT. Let's take a look on, on our processes. And let's be proactive enough, discuss all the process, and see where we can change things to make it better. The reality is that teams don't feel like they can be proactive because they feel like they don't have enough time mm -hmm. to invest in efforts like this. And that is just a scarcity mindset reaction, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a very common thought process where, oh, I can't do that thing. I don't have time to sharpen my saw because I'm busy sawing, mm -hmm. right? But at the rate you're sawing, you'll never finish. And if you just took 20 minutes to sharpen the saw, you'd be done already, right? That's where we need to move to, mm -hmm. is this idea that stepping away heading in the right direction instead of wandering in the wilderness is gonna get you much better outcomes. So when I tell teams, if you spend two hours mapping with me and I can save you an, a, a day a week, then all of a sudden, how much did that two hours cost you, mm -hmm. right? How much would you pay for that? How, how valuable is that effort when you're not only saving that day a week once, you save it every iteration, mm -hmm. every two week sprint, every month release, there's an insane return on investment for these activities. And teams just have to step back and think, all right, so this is the cost of the status quo, right? This is the cost of continuing to saw with a dull blade. And if we could just step back and sharpen the saw, there's no limit to what we could do. For those who want to pursue on, on, this, on this path, what would be your recommendations related to hard skills, soft skills, so one can, can really focus on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, you know, I, I'm investing in creating some education around this in 2021. Hopefully going to take the rest of December and build out some content that helps folks do this, uh, because I think that there's very little content mm -hmm. out there right now. You know, I've, I've got a lot of talks that go over the basics that are on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of good comment, content on YouTube, but the problem with value stream mapping is there's a lot of legacy content that mm -hmm. deals with manufacturing because the roots of value stream mapping are in legacy factories, right? Which isn't the same as knowledge work. You know, there's very different problems mm -hmm. involved. So it can be confusing. Um, you know, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up value stream mapping, you're going to have a bad time. It's all focused on legacy manufacturing. And what we're doing in 2020 and beyond is knowledge work, right? I mean, that's where all the risks, all the opportunities lie is in knowledge work and innovation. So we need a new focus for all the content that we have around value stream mapping. I would say, you know, I can throw you a link to some basic materials. I put everything that I create in the context of knowledge work because that's where I come from. I come from software. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything that I put out is very tech and software and innovation focused. And I've tried to make it really resonate with, with folks who are dealing with 2020 and beyond rather than the roots of something like value stream mapping. But I do think, you know, we have a lot, we have a, a ways to go. And I think even the, you know, the Bible of value stream mapping by Karen Martin, um, is it's a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. She spends a lot of her time focused on all kinds of different industries, not just knowledge work. Mm -hmm. So it can be a lot to get through and there's a lot of sophistication and detail there. So it's not quite a quick start, but if anyone's really interested in it, there's a, there's a ton of material there and she's got video and stuff like that. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's still kind of early days in terms of having perfect content to recommend. It is touched on a lot in different things like, you know, the, the DevOps handbook mentions value stream mapping and uh, lean enterprise is all about value streams. There's a lot of content out there, but nothing really specific. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a book right now that should be coming in 2021. Um, but a lot of these things are work in progress because it's, uh, people are just starting to pay attention to this stuff, which means, you know, if you didn't want to have a bunch of inventory sitting around getting old, now is the time to make content. And so it's really pushing me to create and, and disseminate some, some resources for folks.